Ryan, why don't, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, let's go right into the origin story. Uh, I, I think, obviously, given that this is the real estate track, uh, by show of hands, how many people know who this extremely handsome man is? Okay, so obviously, I think a lot of people know who you are, but is there anything that you want to cover or stuff that hasn't been covered by the show or the mainstream media uh, from a nuance, something that you think brings value? Obviously, you got to, to hear the opening keynote, so maybe there's some build on that. As, as I'm just setting this up before we kind of go into a little bit of a chat here, is there, uh, is there anything you think they should know? Sure. Uh, I mean, I am the original anti-salesman, like by far. Uh, I never wanted to be a real estate broker in my entire life. I think if you had told me when I was 10 years old that I was going to grow up to be a real estate broker, let alone a real estate broker on TV, I would have said that you're fucking crazy. <laughs> one, because I never wanted a real job, right? That was the one thing I ran away from as hard as possible. And two, like, real estate? Like, really? Especially when I was a little kid. Like, I saw the real estate agents that my parents worked with, and I was like, I don't want to do that. I want to be awesome. I don't want to be a broker, that's terrible. And then I grew up and I went to New York City to try to be an actor and that was way harder than Brad Pitt makes it seem. <laughs> and, uh, and that was a wake up call. And I grew up outside Boston um, and then went to college. Yeah, and then I went to college Fuck. in upstate New York. I just realized there's a lot more Patriot fans here than I wanted to. Could I, wait, could I, could I break from the, the origin story for one second and tell a funny story? Great. So I meet Gary for the first time. Well, I met him before, but we actually had breakfast on Monday morning. And we sit there uh, and we sit down. And one of the first things he says to me is, you know what? I don't want to talk about the Patriots because the Patriots have just won the AFC championship, right, on Sunday. He says, there's nothing. You know, Ryan, this was three days ago. Everybody's, this was, yeah, everybody's following three along. Days Keep going. Ago. Good. <laughs> and he's such a diehard, awesome Jets fan, which I think, is, I think is great, right? To have love and everything for a sport that way. And he said, there's nothing I, I hate more than a 33-year-old Patriots fan. <laughs> so I'm 33. <laughs> and I grew up outside Boston. And I'm a proud Patriots fan. And it's okay. You know, All right? You know, you know what's interesting? Actually, just to build on something earlier, my theory on 33... I can't believe that. Uh, I did say that. I said, I was talking about the Patriots and I was talking about like if you're 33 and you've been a Patriot fan or you're a Boston fan you suck similar to the point that I was making out there about if you weren't punched in the mouth yet because you've been in business since 2009 if you're 33 and a Boston sports fan you've won all four championships you win all the time and so in a weird way I think that slightly makes you a loser <laughs> I do I do Yes. <laughs> so anyway, go ahead, Ryan. So that happened on Monday. And Ryan, uh, tell these two ladies who you are because they were whispering to each other and like, who is that? Right, so uh, for people who don't know who I am, my, is this on, right? You can hear yeah, me? Yeah, you're on. Yeah. My name is Ryan Serhant and I do a TV show on Bravo called Million Dollar Listing New York. And I've been on since the beginning. We started taping that show in 2010. It didn't come out until 2012. And right now we're taping season seven. Uh, and I actually have my own show on Bravo now called Sell It Like Sirhant that'll premiere this spring. I'm not allowed to tell you when yet because it's, it's, a, it's a big date, uh, and it'll come out this spring, and it's just me, so you better watch it, all these people in here. It's the first kind of business show that Bravo has done like this, and so it's going to be pretty cool. Set uh, your fucking DVR. Do, do we it. Still have, do we still have those? Do they still exist? No, right? Like, it's unfucking believable These technologies come in and out. All right, so Rai, yeah. you didn't want to do that, but... You did, you know, you were telling your origin story, you said a real estate broker, but one on TV. That caught my attention because you did come, you like, you did want to be a TV, you wanted to be an actor. Yeah. I, the when did that happen? Uh, when I was like four, I think. I made my little brother do little home movies with me. My mom was the videographer and I made, I had this whole trove of home movies that I made where I kill my little brother. I don't know why, every single movie, <laughs> he just happens to die. Is his name Kenny? No, yeah, my little brother's name is, is Jack. Uh, and I, I, no matter what though, I knew that I wanted to grow up and be successful. No matter what I did. I thought I was going to be acting. I thought I was going to be on Broadway, right? That was my, my thing. And it didn't work out for me. And I thought that that was devastating. I did a soap opera for a little short period of time when I first came to New York. And then they killed me off. Karma. Right? <laughs> and they killed me off. What show? What show? As the World Turns. I took a, uh, nice. I took a yeah, Evan Walsh the fourth. That's who I was, and I took a syringe to the heart while I was on top <laughs> of a hospital, awaiting my helicopter to take me to the Caribbean, where I could do my research in peace. 
And that was, and then I thought my life was over. And I had no money, and I lived in Koreatown, and it was go home to Colorado, where my parents then moved to, and paint fence for the rest of my life. Or it was Hold gonna, on, hold on. Yeah. Oh, your parents lived in Colorado. Yeah. How long? Uh, they moved to Colorado when I graduated high school in okay, 2002. Fine. I was going to make a point about the Patriots thing, but keep going. Yeah. So, uh, so I didn't want to go home, and I said, you know what, I'll stay in New York. i got to make this work, because from when I was a little kid, I chose success first. Whatever I was going to do to be successful, I would figure out later. And I meet a lot of people who say, I want to be a successful real estate agent, but they choose real estate first, or they choose something else first. And I think that's where a lot of people then make the mistake, because if they have a small little hiccup or a small little bump in the road, it's like world over for them. Oh, I lost that deal. World over. What am I going to do? Oh, my life is over. But if you choose success first, that's what I did. So I had no money. I lived in Koreatown. I, I didn't want to go home. And so I got my real estate license. It was like 300 bucks at the time. And I rented apartments for 1,000 and 2,000 bucks a month on 31st and 32nd Street. And I did shares. I found three people, put them in a one bedroom, put up fake walls. I ran all over the place. I didn't have a suit. And that's what I did. And then there was an open casting call in The Real Deal and Curbed for a show called Million Dollar Listing New York, which is going to be the New York franchise of the LA show. And I went to an open casting call at the Hudson Hotel with 3,000 agents. And they took everyone 30 seconds at a time with 3,000 of us. And they said, why should you be on this show? And I said, why the fuck do you think I should be on this show? Because I'm the greatest. You showed them your face? No. I just said, all I said was, I'm the greatest. And they bought it. (laughs) And then I had to figure it out. After six months of casting, and they said, okay, we're going to put you on the show, and there were four of us right, who filmed the whole first note, season. The greatest definitely came out of your mouth, but were you able to say, like on a very, very tangible note, were you able to say, hey, look, I was on the fucking As the World Turns. Like, obviously, I'm in the game. Like, did that, like, on, on a very serious kick? Uh, not really, you know, because I, they were really pushing to find the best real estate agents in New York City. Which you weren't. I, no, they started casting at the beginning of 2010. My first day in real estate brokerage at all was September 15th, 2008. That was the day Lehman Brothers filed for bankruptcy, which is the only reason I know that date. Because that was my first day in the conference room, like, dude, we're gonna, I want to be a broker now. It's going to be awesome. And everyone staring at the TV as the world comes crashing down. And for a lot of people, right, I, it was awful. For me, I had no money. For everybody to, because I think I'm going to bounce a little bit from the talk earlier, I, we keep, it's, I, it's interesting, I almost feel weird because I feel like we're about to predict like a crash, like that we keep referencing this day back in, in 2008. Just for, for, again, for people that are, are early in their career or were in different businesses, on that day, within 24 hours, Wine Library when you when you sell wine, you can pre-sell it and you can sell futures. So we get to take the money and, and the customer gets to save a lot of money on a wine that comes out 18 months later. And you can only do that with the most sought after wine, right? No different than the most sought after anything that you do, right? Literally, within 24 hours of that day, we had $1.7 million of $2.4 million of Bordeaux that was sold have to be refunded because that many people knew the world had just crashed or worked at a Wall Street firm. Like, literally, that's how much it melted. Literally, and don't forget, we're playing on that float. So we're using those dollars for other things because it's in and, you know, up until that point for, you know, nine years, we had 1% cancellations. So it it was a significant, I mean, like, you're not joking. Like, if you walked in, like, you know, wide-eyed and excited, like, literally the veterans in that office were like, fuck, we're about to go through a three- to five-year window of straight shit. Yeah. And so hindsight's 2020. So it was the worst time to get started in business, but at the same time, it was the absolute best time because a lot of brokers were getting out of the business, right? The guy who got me into the business, a friend of mine from college, he was selling apartments on Craigslist. That's all he needed to do. He put ads on Craigslist, would meet people on the street corner, take them a few buildings in New York City. They'd buy one. Contracts were signed on the spot, 10% deposits, stated income loans all day. That was it. The day I started, all of that disappeared. So uh, with the reason I got into the business... He's like, hey, bro, it's just Craigslist. We're going to fucking kill it. That's what, that's, and people were starting up brokerages everywhere, right? When times are great, everyone can do anything. And so I said, okay, I'll do this to pay my rent, pay for food, and that way I can go to auditions and do things you know, that I want to do on my own. And then the minute I did my first deal... And I made $1,000 because I rented a $2,000 a month apartment. And commissions, you know, in New York City anyway, are one month's rent, let's say, on a rental. And a brand new broker, you take 50-50 with the house. 
And that was a one day showing and I got $1,000 and I was rich. And I literally, I remember that day, it was models and bottles all day. So. <laughs> you, so you flew back to Boston because you definitely couldn't afford that in New York, which is a first rate city. Well, right, exactly. My rent where I was, uh, was $1, $1,167 at the time. So that was towards rent. And then I just wanted to make sure that I did as many deals as possible. And then all of a sudden I was like, wait a minute, there's only so much time in the day. Why am I spending so much time going to actors' equity auditions and sitting here and being told no to my face and no about my gray hair and no about this and no about that that's so personal when I could meet people on the street, I could show them apartments that aren't mine. <laughs> I, I don't have to do anything else other than make personal connections and then if they like a space, I get paid for it. Like I, don't, I didn't create anything, especially when I was a brand new agent. I was like, this is a job and anybody can do it. You can get off a boat in New York City with under $500, and that is it. You can, in, you can make millions and millions of dollars, and all you have to do is meet human beings, and that, that was my aha moment, right? And there was a guy if, in my if, office. If you have the serendipity of your parents having sex at the exact moment that gave you the charisma and people skills to be able to do that, right? I mean, I think the thing that's super interesting for me from afar about this industry is that... I'll respond. The... 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 The game is extremely lucrative for a certain personality trait. To me, what's so attractive about this industry is it is the greatest ROI if you have a certain human skill. Because there's a ton of people who can never sell anything because their personal skills suck, right? Like the emotional intelligence which is emerging in society, period, has always been a huge arbitrage in real estate. No, I'm asking. Uh, I disagree. Go ahead. Um, I, when I first got into real estate, I, that was my one deal. I got addicted. And then like most people who get into real estate, I did no deals. <laughs> and then I couldn't figure it out. I was like, this sucks. This sucks. But there was a guy in my office. Uh, his name was Ben. And he was from bed Brooklyn. He had his first kid when he was 17. Ben from bed -Stuy. Yeah. Okay, keep going. Right? He had his first kid when he was 17. He sold drugs and he got into real estate to help pay the bills. And he did deals every single day. Because he was a drug dealer. That's the best fucking training in the game. Maybe. Maybe. I only want to hire drug dealers. But he was completely quiet. You should. Guys, drug dealing, I, listen, I make a lot of content for 15 to 17 year olds on Instagram and I hit up, the, I talk to them on DM all the time and these kids are fucking selling a lot of weed and I'm like, dickface, do you understand that th you, all you have to do is just take that same skill and make that about Yeezys and Supremes and you'll make 10x the money and you'll be legit? I mean, drug dealing is the training ground for gangsters in sales. <laughs> because not only do you have to sell, you have to fucking navigate the law. <laughs> and your parents. I'm a big fan of drug dealers. No one who works for me sells drugs, by the way. But I don't think it's just charisma. I think anybody can sell. Anybody can be taught to sell. Obviously, there are people with natural born talent who have charisma, who have great personalities, and they're people people. But then there are other people that don't like that. Like I, that's why I started this conversation by saying that I was the anti-salesman. Dude, I was overweight, chubby, face riddled with acne when I was in high school. I didn't want to talk to anybody. My Saturday nights were snick, right? There's guys in here that I went to high school with. I, I didn't have that many friends. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I was shy, totally ruined my self-confidence. The last thing I ever wanted to do was go into Starbucks in Manhattan and try to talk to people about renting apartments. Are you kidding me? I don't know what I'm talking about. But my back was up against the wall because I had no money. So I had to figure out, okay, if I'm gonna stay here, I've got my real estate license, I might as well figure out how to do this. I'm gonna leave my, my self-consciousness and my ego at the door, whatever that might be, and I'm just gonna start hawking real estate. I'm gonna talk about it like I know what I'm talking about, I'm just gonna figure it out. And then I worked every single day. And that's what the new show on Bravo is about. It's called Sell It Like Sirhan, and it's working with people who are the worst salespeople in the history of the world, and you will see, it is ridiculous and helping them through what their hurdles are, figuring out what their wall is, figuring out what their what is, what their who is, what their win is, right? If your win is just to make a lot of money, it's gonna be hard for you. Because how do you work towards that every day? I'm gonna make a lot of money today. Okay, great, go, okay, go do it. But if you figure out what your win is and what your wall is, 
Like, what, what's the worst thing that could happen to you if you don't sell something today? That's your motivation for tomorrow. And I think that anybody who doesn't have a great personality or great charisma right now can become a great salesperson if they work at it. But everybody has different hurdles they got to get over. Do you, or, do you, so let's talk about this to make it about the audience. Obviously, as your profile grew with the success of the show, what is the majority of questions you're being asked via DMs on Instagram, via email, when somebody stops you in the street? What is the, what is the current state of questions in the sector that are coming to you based on where you're positioned in the market? Everybody asks how to get started. I mean, everybody asks me, how do I get started? Or they've been in the business for a year or two and they don't know how to get started. That's what everybody wants to know. Even downstairs, we were on you know, the field with you and people asking, what do I do? Like, how do I, how do I get over that kind of like first hump in the business? I don't know anybody, I don't have connections, I don't, have, I don't even know, you know the paperwork, what do I do? And I tell everybody, there's two things you need to do. No matter what, right, you meet five new people every single day because you have to add to your social currency, we talked about that, right? You gotta add to your data, ba your data book, right? Your, your Rolodex, your, your Excel sheet, whatever you use, and you have to work with somebody else. You cannot do it by yourself. That was the biggest mistake that I made, that a lot of people think they can get into real estate, they got their license, boom, I'm gonna be the best broker ever. Work with someone who's been in the business forever, work for them for free, just listen to the conversation, listen to how they talk to people, look at how they write their emails, meet the brokers that they know, meet the clients that they know, learn from them, take the best, leave the rest, then do it on your own. That's what I tell people, I mean, that's, that's it. It's interesting to me, obviously, we talk, you know, you're, you're, you've gotten passionate about teaching sales. You're reverse engineering yourself because it, it didn't come natural. You just told your high school story, which was fun. Um, do you think it's better for people to, who don't, you know, so I think you think about sales the way I think about any skill, and I agree with you, which is everybody here can be better at everything. You could be a better singer than you are right now. My biggest question always is, you could be better at basketball, you could be better at playing American football, but I have a good feeling that you weren't built to be on the field here every Sunday. I'm very fascinated by the Mendoza line of somebody trying to become a salesperson, get better at sales, what's their upside? Because I agree with you, they can go from here to here, but it, does it close the delta that they should do that versus spending a lot of time trying a lot of different things and becoming self-aware and figuring out the thing that has their biggest upside? When you think about this, and as you're, you know, you're going through uh, probably a, a process that happened similar to me, it was you know, my first decade in business, it was about me establishing what I wanted. Then you start reverse engineering, like, you start asking yourselves like, how the fuck did this happen? Why is this happening? You start thinking about your, your, how you were parented, where you, were, where you come from. A lot of you know I talk about a lot of this stuff. I was just curious for myself, and I thought it'd be interesting here, do you think that sales is such an incredibly core skill set that everybody should try to get better at that, or do you think that some people just have this little upside with that, and the real game is self-awareness and trying to figure themselves out, because there's, maybe they're an operator, maybe they're a back office person, maybe owning 3% of a company where somebody else is doing all that magic because they're just organized and meticulous, and that's, they've got huge upside in that, They'll never drop any ball, but really their sales will only go up. So where do you put sales as a skill and its upside versus self-awareness? For one, I think that everybody's a salesperson, whether you think you are or not, right? I mean, when I was a little kid, like I said, right, I had a little bit of a weight problem. I was selling my mom on giving me more pudding. Like, I really like those Jello snack packs with whipped cream on top, and I like to have three of them. I don't know why that was a problem. And so... <laughs> My mom, my parents didn't want me to eat that much and I had to negotiate with them. I had to sell them on why I should have an extra one. I balanced out time instead of having them all right at four o'clock. I said, you know what, I'll do one at four, one at seven and then if I do this one thing for you, I'll get one before I go to bed. And that's where I really learned how to sell and all of us sell something. Even if you're back office, even if you're IT, you are selling a program. You are selling your system of how to manage email. You're selling the fact that you need to come in at five o'clock because that's better for your schedule than coming in at nine when it's better for your client's schedule. So we're all salespeople and we can all become better salespeople which will help us do better in whatever it is our job is. But I agree with you in a little bit that I, I don't think everybody should be a real estate agent. I don't feel that everybody should be selling body lotion on the street. 
right? I worked with someone on the show who did that. That's the only reason I mentioned that. Um, but I think that you have to find what you love and that you can, that you can actually make money doing. Right? I kind of hate it when people say, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. That's, that's great if you fucking have money. Do you think that right? So honestly, I'm very fascinated by this subject matter. I know, I live a very interesting life. I was such a terrible student that a lot of my high school and specifically my college friends, and even less so my college friends, my college acquaintances, um, I mean a stunning percentage of the people that I knew between six and 22 make under $75,000 a year. And a stunning percentage of the people that I've been doing business with from 2000 and seven to 2012 are make over or have net worth over five million dollars a year. And I'm, and I'm kind of like, I, I live almost in this bizarro two different world world and I am fascinated by how many of my friends that make $67,000 a year and have hit their zone are truly, truly, truly happy sure. and how many are at $17 million net worth and are miserable as fuck. Like, you know, to me, I genuinely do believe that, you know, rich is a very funny kind of vague self, self kind of inside game. So for example, this is just my truth. When I made $100,000 a year, that was like, I've never felt the same way since. I've never felt as at peace. As, that was a number for me. Like I'm comfortable, I was comfortable living my lifestyle under that monarchy. Um, I, I'm fascinated by this conversation. Like I really think a lot more, and this is why I talk a lot about doing, like going very niche. So for me, I'm a big believer that a lot of people here who make 236 a year should make 147 putting out content around ALF, the sitcom from the 80s. Like what I'm fascinated by is the extreme long tail of the internet and the monetization of crazy niches. How many people here are familiar with the fact that eight to 10 year old, six to 10 year old girls in America are making slime at home like in a big way? So good, do you know about this phenomenon? No. Okay, so homemade slime, okay. right? It's huge. I know, I know a couple people who were in love with arts and crafts, loved making this stuff, and have been doing this and making little videos about slime making for six years, and like literally that was their lives, and then you know the market comes to them. They were making $13,000 a year in AdSense three years ago, now they're making a million to two million dollars a year in branded content and, and ads and things of that nature, and higher. I think this is the beginning. I'm fascinated by the, the do you think the wealth thing, and I think you're right, and let me tell you where on the subtlety, rich or what have you, I think it's a lot easier when your income, how much you take home, is controlled by what you spend. People get stressed when their balance sheet and P&L is broken. So some people know how to live under 100,000 and there's people in here making half a million but they're buying so much shit that they're so vulnerable and deep down, deep down, they are stressed because they know if shit hits the fan, they're fucked. Where do you actually sit on this like happiness of work dollar kind of conversation? Like nuanced, I heard you, but next sure. level. Uh, I live and I tell people to live probably 10% over comfortable, right? Whatever your comfort level is, don't go 100% over because we've all read in the news, you've seen the articles, you've seen somebody on the street who, who went 100% over comfortable and that was stupid, right? So I never tell people to live outside their means or to live at their means either because then how are you gonna push yourself? The only way that I got over $100,000 a year was by saying, this is great, I'm not broke, but it's still not enough, right? So how are do you, I get are to you, that next Are level? you at enough now? No. Do you think you'll ever be at enough? No. No. That means you love, that means you love the process. That, yeah, means, well, that means it's I'm not a, the money. Yeah. What's that? Trust the sure. Yeah, trust it, but like he loves it. Trusting it is different than loving it, right? Like I don't trust that if I work hard, it'll be okay. I love working hard. Yeah. I love fucking, I love fucking being the working dog. And I love, I love working that. for myself. Because, well, he just loves, he just loves the oh, process. Oh, what's up, Ruben? So, 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 so you, you, you think you love the process. I love the work, right? Right. I, I mean, love the process, and I love, I love doing whatever I want to do every single day. And not having to punch in or punch out. 
I, I just didn't want to do it. I was like, I, 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 I'm going to live a short life, and then I will die, and that will be it. And the worst thing in the world for me is to say, good thing I went to my job. Like, that sucks. And that terrified me when I was 10. I, I remember, like, crying in the bathtub. I was a weird little kid, but I was crying <laughs> in the bathtub about, like, about growing up, doing nothing, and then dying. And so I said to myself, Do you have like, any clue why that happened? Was there like a grandparent, a parent? Like, did you watch some weird soap opera? Like, do you have any clue why that was happening? I think uh, a lot of it came from my parents, for sure. A lot of it came from my parents. I was raised very, very strict, and they always had me work incredibly hard to understand the value of the dollar, the value of work, and the value of making something of yourself because no one else is going to do it. And that was, that's what was hard for me about acting, that I could do the best audition ever, Right? But somebody else had control. Yeah, someone else had control. Or someone else looked a different way. Or someone else did do this, you, did that. Knowing that you're vlogging now and building your profile, do you view the way I'm producing media as potentially a better way than the way that you're doing it through television? Because you have even more control? Oh, 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 oh. Because listening to you carefully, what sure. must be massively frustrating is the way they post edit the show when you knew that you put magic, but they're trying to create a narrative on that episode. Uh, sort of. I mean, listen, TV is TV. Maybe it, it will eventually change, but networks have been pretty good recently about adapting different forms of media. And I would not be here today if it weren't for Right. Bravo. Ultimately, the ROI for is TV. so extraordinary in yeah. every direction, you can deal with some of the shortcomings. Yes, I mean, of course. And whatever I put on, on TV, they, it's not like CGI. It was me doing it. And if things get cut for time, they get cut for time. But listen, Million Dollar Listing airs to 25 million people around the world. Like, I can't, I can't do that even on social media. I mean, not well, right you now. you could. Right? You yeah, could. maybe, eventually, but not when I'm a 33 Patriots fan, right? I get it. Right? I get it. So, especially when you're starting, right, that was a huge layup for me. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's the yeah, catalyst. But I think that what's great now is that you don't have to wait for a 3,000-person open casting call. You can do what we're talking about. How many people watch the show? Okay, great. Quite a bit. So, let's get into some of that. Who is your favorite cast member? Like, who are you actually, like, friendly with? Or, like, let's get into some of this My shit. wife. I know that. She's right there, by the way. I know that. I keep looking at to her at the corner of my right eye, like, Is she the radar? Of, like, got it. Yes. She gives me this, and she Besides gives me this. Besides your lovely wife, who is your favorite? And, and there's been different people that have come in and out. Honestly, like, you know, this is a positive. This isn't who do you hate. Who, do, who of the crew have, you know, the characters have you liked the most or have a relationship with? Or maybe you don't. It's all who professional. Who of the three of us? Well, the three, there's been, what, six of you through the years? How many have there been through no, the years? In New York, not so many. There was, uh, there was Michael Lorber season first one. Year, yep. And then there's there was There's a new dude who's Luis. like a model. With, well, there's yeah. Luis, so I know. And now there's Steve. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's it. Six. Yeah. And okay. so, yeah, I mean, I've always had the best camaraderie, even though we've had some ups and downs with, with Fred because we've been in it together from the beginning. But he's, he's also 10 years older than I am, and so we were never like contemporaries, we weren't peers. Right. Right? I, was, I was young and he was doing, you know, he'd been in the business for 10 years. Yeah. I still haven't to this day been in this business for 10 years. My 10 year anniversary is this September. And so he had already been doing real estate. So I got into it trying to figure out how the hell am I gonna find listings to put on a million dollar listing show. I'm, I'm renting apartments in the financial <laughs> district. <laughs> I told them I was the greatest broker in the history of the world. Holy shit, I gotta figure this out. And that's what I did. It was, you know, the best thing that the show did for me was it was a metaphorical shotgun to my head to not stop working. Because the last thing I needed was a show to millions of people telling everyone that I sucked at real estate. That would be no good for business. So I made sure that, and I always think about future Ryan, right? About myself five years from now. Because I don't care about myself yesterday, he's dead. And I care about myself tomorrow, and I care about myself in five years. So I think every day about future Ryan. What should I pitch today that will help future Ryan? And the same thing with the show, right? We film a year in advance sometimes. I have and a good idea for you real quick. Yeah. Where's your team, like the con your content team? Where They're they? there, that's Adam, go. that's Alex, go. that's Joe. You guys have to get somebody to draw a future Adam. A future Ryan, excuse me. You have to create a future Ryan cartoon character, and when he references it, you need to edit it in. Cool. Do that. 
<laughs> He's like, done, dude. I'll cartoon it. I got you. It'll be a stick figure. No, but I think I think it's I think it's an interesting thought, right? Like, I I I, I think it's, it's super important to pro, to not project like I'm going to be successful. It's just being a, it's about being thoughtful about the chess moves and creating your strategy of like where you want to be, you know, from a happy zone, from a financial zone, from a professional zone. Yeah, because everyone talks about living in the now. Like that's that's great, but the now is whoever you prepared to be for the last five years, right? So, uh, you know, I know I came to New York City to be an actor, but it's a bit serendipitous that I quit acting. Well, I was fired. But I quit, got out of it, didn't like it, hated that business. No one in college teaches you the business of acting. They teach you how to be a clock and a frog, and that's your craft. And then you go to New York, and they're like, uh, we don't want you to be a frog. We want you to look like this and dance like this. No? Okay, no money for you. And that by getting out of it and getting into real estate, I then get back in front of a camera to do what I wanted to do in the first place anyway, because I set up those building blocks from the beginning. So that was my story. Those were my building blocks. You have to figure out what your own are. Like, what is it? Maybe it's real estate and food. There are agents I know who are, who are so obsessed with food. That's their passion. Real estate to them is a job. And so they mix the both. Every week, they have weekly dinners with their clients. They cook. They figure out new recipes. Every listing they do, they take listing photos with food in it. Because that's what they love. That's what gets them up every single day. That's their thing. If your thing is cats, cat it up. Right? <laughs> well, cats everywhere. If that's what makes you happy. Because progress is happiness. And if you're doing a little bit more tomorrow than you were doing today, that's going to set you up for future you. And if you don't think that way, then I don't know. That's my stress. My stress isn't financial stress. Even if I buy something, even if I do something, I know I'm going to work my ass off. Everything's going to be OK. I don't let that affect me. What I let affect me is that I'm not planning and that I'm not using enough of my potential. Because one day I will be dead, right? And I know you talk about this a lot as well. You know, that one day we will be dead. And did you milk your potential as much as you possibly could? I think That's it's why hard. I say beat five people a day. I think it's hard to quantify how ridiculously rare it is to become a human being. It's just not what we think about. And then how quickly it all happens, right? Like, I mean, it just goes so fast. Right, it, it, you know, it, it's the same old thing in life, right? It takes forever, but it's it seems like yesterday. But yeah, I just I don't. To me, the bigger issue at hand is the practical things. Like there were humans like us who lived during the Black Plague, like that was in the world, and a stunning amount of us died. People that lived during the great, you know, our, the greatest generation we talk a lot about in the U.S. were like, you know, for a lot of people that were born in the late 1800s, like you know, early 1900s, the prime of their lives, their lives were during, you know real conflict in the world, wars and things of that nature. We, all of us, everyone, from the oldest person here to the youngest, have lived in unbelievable prosperity. Like, it has been so uncomfortable. Like, you, you know, I, I don't know, I like looking at history to like, at, things, are, things wrap around data. It is very impossible for me to get excited about complaining about dumb shit like, like the line was too long or I got the wrong, I got skim milk instead of almond milk. Like stuff that I hear people talk about when we, us humans, are living through the greatest era that humans have ever lived through of prosperity and wealth and happiness and health. This is ridiculous. And now, on top of that, you layer this thing called the internet, which is a new invention on the consumer side and scales the living shit out of all of our ambitions and wants and eliminates the middleman that you hate so much. Yeah. Winners hate the middleman because that's somebody that can stop merit. What bothered you was merit. Yeah. What I am blown away by, by the internet and where all your opportunities sit is the merit of it all. If you're not doing well, it's because you suck. The market is telling you, you suck. I love how people are like, how the fuck has that person got 87,000 followers? She sucks. I'm like, well, you suck more because you have 1,300 and you've decided to make that your judgment. And not that you should trade on followers, but like the day of judging. You know, back in the day, Rick, the casting guy, decided you weren't cute enough, smiley enough, funny enough. So Rick could have been flawed. We are now living in a platform that is exposing the truths. If you're not doing well, it means you're not good at it. And so many people spending time trying to tear down other people's buildings instead of focusing on having to get in their shit together. Yeah. What, uh, what, what, I got an interesting question here that I've been thinking about. What, what happens to future Ryan in five years? 
Like where are you, like right this second, you're thinking about him. I'm dying to hear your current bullet points on him. I, someone just asked me that on the field. They thought, where, where is everything gonna be in five years? And I think more than just me, I think, I mean, how many people in here are real estate agents or real estate brokers? All of them, this is the real estate track. Oh, thanks. <laughs> just wanna make sure. I do these things and I ask that and like four people raise their hands. I'm like, oh, I went to the wrong one. <laughs> Uh, so the, I honestly think within the next five years, the brokerage model as we know it in the United States will be over. That is my, that is my prediction. So let's go, let's go, that's a hyperbole statement. It's a short period of time. Give me the nuances underneath that. I'm naive. I don't even know what the brokerage model is. Explain in detail what you mean by that. It's extrapolating on what you're talking about right now. It's that... Anybody can market themselves in any other way they want. They can cut out the middle person. Why do I have to go to a brokerage that takes 20%, 10%, 30%, 50% for me to go and meet somebody to make money when I show them an apartment or sell them an apartment? What's, what's the brokerage for? I understand that there's, there's a legal need for it now, but I do think that that's going to change. But Maybe it's not five years. Are Maybe you it's a little bit Are you going to start your own brokerage? I, I don't think it's going to be a brokerage. I don't like the idea of, of having a brokerage. I don't want people to feel like, like I own them in some way, right? Like if, so you, you, if anyone here leaves their brokerage today, any of your contracts that you have signed that you haven't been paid on, that brokerage is like, ha, 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 ha. I did nothing for this, and I will take a massive cut. And you can't go do what you want to do. Some of you might have great agreements. Some of you might be able to cut and run. I, I don't know what your situation is. But most people, they're tied into that brokerage, and that's a thing. But does the brokerage gives you leads every day? Do they supply anything else other than maybe some admin work you can do with a task rabbit? Right? Like they say, there is an app for that. It's an app. It's an app. You should look it up. Yeah. You can do things on your own now. You don't need that brokerage to pay for that person to do that thing because everything is automated. Everything is automated. Oh, everything's wait, on YouTube. Everything's out there. You guys, don't need to do it anymore. Guys, wait till we get to AI and machine learning. Task rabbit's going to seem archaic. It's yeah. just going to automatically happen. And I think that instead of having some powerhouse brokerages, you're just going to have a lot of awesome brokers who work for themselves or work in individual teams. And that's all that needs to happen. And that's so, what I want to work towards. And you can tell anybody that I said so, that I just don't care. And so, well, good news. It's being filmed at scale. So this is not about telling anybody. The data's there. It'll be on, on the web in a second. I think what's interesting to me is it's how AJ and I view the sports representation business, right? We started Vayner Sports because when we look at the agents that are taking commissions for doing what has in the past been important or had a value, but now has become completely different. And so for me, as you're talking, I'm like, oh, I see what he's saying. It's the same as every business, you know, what brokerages are gonna have to do is they're gonna have to evolve. Like for example, Vayner has a much better chance to start a brokerage because instead of- You wanna do it? Maybe. I, I think, in, you know, I, because what I'm realizing is like, oh, I see, we can take those fat commissions and those healthy commissions, but what we'll do is we'll create a model where it's not about back office or history, we're gonna build out people's personal brands at scale, which is actually gonna lead them into real revenue. I'm gonna Vince McMahon you, right? I'm gonna make you the ultimate warrior. I'm gonna make you Hillbilly Jim. That's where the money really is. It's in actually doing something that's tangible in reality. So even though everybody can be a badass broker, a lot of people, what they really need is brand equity so that the funnel comes in and that's the only thing that the Vayner machine is, is it's a communication, you know, death star. 100%. And so that's what it's gonna turn into. Yeah. I mean, look at, you know, in, in New York anyway, right, we have- Got we have another business. We have designer gyms, right? There's designer gyms all the time. There's everywhere. There's Barry's Bootcamp, there's Rumble, there's, there's SoulCycle, there's all these designer gyms. I remember when you used to go to the gym to lift weights or get on a treadmill. Now, especially in New York and other urban areas, you go to work out because of a person. You go to work out, at, not at 9 a.m. because that's when it's good for you. You go at 10 a.m., you work your schedule around because you're going with that trainer, and that trainer's gonna work you out the best, right? And we're addicted to it now. I know in New York we are. People are addicted to their trainers, and we wrap our lives around those people. And the gym space, right, the equinoxes of the world have, have embraced that, and they're changing that model. Same thing as brokerage. You don't go to a Douglas Elliman, right, because you're going to work with that chairman or that brand, right? You're going to that specific agent. And so then what's the brand for? 
What's it really do anymore? And now I understand that right now still does a little bit, right? Because our generation, my generation, needs to get a little bit older to phase things out, and we will enact that change, and I will be at the front of it. I swear to you. That sounds like a good admission. I mean, look, look, what, you know, listening to the scattering of claps, when, when you talk about change, everybody just listened to that from their perspective. So everybody just consumed your you know, four minute rant on this issue of squeezing out the middle, right? This is all I think about, and, and I think a lot of what you're talking about is a good subject to spend the rest of the time. Because what, when I was listening to the claps and the energy of the room, everybody just consumed from their perspective. If you're new, right? If you're early in your career, you're like, yeah. That's exactly right. Like, what the fuck? If you're actually a brokerage, you're like, fuck this dude. Like, this is how, this is how I make my dollars. But, but this is super important for everybody to understand. I spent a lot of time with companies that look like Toys R Us. I, I spent, I loved Toys R Us growing up. It was the kingdom. Like, when my sister and I got to go to Toys R Us, Same. that was like, Greatest place that ever. was like everything, right? So, and... And Toys R Us is based in New Jersey, right? And so for the last four years, I've taken four to six different meetings, different restarts and resets with the CEO or the CMO of Toys R Us over the last six years because it was emotionally interesting. You know, back to like being able to do anything you wanted every time. It wasn't going to be the biggest scope or the best use of my time. It was just fun for me because it brought back great memories and I wanted Toys R Us as a client. And I would go in there and every time I would tell them, you were in deep fucking shit. Uh, there's basic data here. Walmart is getting way too much of the toy business that looks like you, right? The, and Amazon's coming for your lunch and influencers are gonna start selling this stuff on YouTube Kids directly and where are you going? And because they didn't like what they were hearing, they didn't hire me or, and a lot of times people don't hire me, they'll just change, you know, they don't wanna pay our premium, they go for the second rate thing or the third rate thing or try to do it internally, right, and, and do it themselves. But Toys R Us didn't either. Toys R Us is out of business. Toys R Us has no reason for being out of business. They could have made exclusive deals, they could have sold directly. All the Toys R Us's in the country could have turned into entertainment systems and centers. You don't want to spend time with your kids. You could have dropped them off there for fucking three hours and left. They could have fucking dominated, but because they were emotional about how they got there, So for everybody who was just listening to Ryan and didn't like what was coming out of his mouth, what I tell you to do is realize, take your money, decide if you think he's right, I'll give you the preview, he's right. It's the internet, my friends, it's the fucking internet. It's not him or me, it's the internet. It eliminates everything that is commodity. So listen very carefully and adjust your model to be you know, it doesn't have to, the term brokerage, I'm an agency. VaynerMedia is an agency. No different than fucking, in your world, the Elman and Remax or Weicker or whatever all that's, in that world, like, we have it too. Ogilvy and fucking, you know, WPP and all this. We're the same, but we're different. And I think for everybody who cares to be, who's on the other side of the conversation right now, who's a brokerage or building one or about to build one or cares about one, you can still do that. What you provide has to change. You could build a huge toy store today, the biggest one in the world. What you provide has to change. A big box in a mall or a solid location in a town where you walk in and you buy it at a decent price isn't good enough anymore. The same way as in 1954, being in the downtown and being a five and dime with toys at a good healthy markup, became vulnerable to Toys R Us. This is the thing that pisses me off. The bro- I know nothing about the brokerage industry. I promise you the brokerage thing disrupted something else that existed in real estate 30, 60, 90 years ago. It's the same game. Netflix is gonna get punked one day too. Because what happens is people become complacent. And so when you hear that rant, I just highly recommend that you're thoughtful about instead of saying fuck that, putting your head in the sand and thinking it's about a successful guy's opinion, this is about the fucking internet and it's gonna fucking break your face unless you ride the wave because too many of you are looking at the wave coming at you and you think you're somebody because you've had some success, this thing is gonna fucking kill you. Amen. And, and, and here's, here's why I'm passionate about it. It shouldn't kill you. All you have to do is have the humility and patience and work ethic to grab that little surfboard that's right here and jump on it and ride this thing 
to the fucking moon and my entire rant this morning was you're way ahead of 98% of the people because you wouldn't have spent the money on the ticket to be here if you weren't. You have to understand, action's louder than words. The fact that you know my content, right? The fact that you even were in a funnel, the the fact that so many of you traveled. How many people here flew to be at this conference? That's fucking ridiculous. That's ridiculous. The fact that you're there, the fact that you're there, you're so close, now the only thing that's holding you back is the money and how you're making it now and the complacency in that. What do you want to leave everybody with? What's a, what's a good general tone for what you're seeing where, you know, from your day-to-day life as an actual executor of this craft, as a personal brand that's using a different medium, as you're getting the tone of the last talk and this talk? What's a good way to close out these last couple of minutes? What do you think is a nuance or a, a thought starter that's a little less theoretical because I think you've established a great overall strategy? Is there anything that we haven't touched on in my talk or here right now that you think may bring them value? Oof. Uh, I think that, I mean, listen, I think that a lot of people get nervous about the idea of control, which you talk about a lot. And if I'm going to leave this group with, with anything, and I have one thing to show everybody, right? I want to make sure that we, we do that. So I'm, this is why I never am like the host or the person to ask questions. I black out when I do talks. Literally, there was only one thing I had to do here, and I fucked it up. <laughs> so thank you, it's Ryan, right. for saving me. Don't worry. Uh, but obviously it. you're so good at what you do. We're about to show you something pretty rad. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're approved still, right? I know at some point it was kind of like, can we do it, can we not? Yeah, we we still it, can't do it, but we're gonna do it anyway. Is that, that's really true, right? Yeah. So you're breaking the rules a little bit. Yeah, but I, so, uh, yeah, so control, fuck control, right? Take control of your own life. 